It's called Malcolm the X. People will remember what X stood for in math class in terms of Roman numerals. A college teacher was amazed. Mouth open wide in astonishment when the young blood presenting his discussion of black leadership of the 60s made reference to that great black hero, Malcolm the Tenth. <laughs> now, this might well be commentary of some kind about what we know and certainly what we've yet to learn. But then certainly we could have used nine others. <laughs> Chinese restaurant. He was white in his late 40s and taking supper in Copley Square while working a Sunday sweeping ship gig. He spoke as loud as any American overseas tourist to the young Taiwanese sisters, interspersing su stupid jokes that he thought Asians would find cute along with more would-be serious talk angling toward a subliminal pass, verbal pats on the behind. And the women, who understand English spoken well or merely good, softly or loudly, waited upon the barbarian with a smile 5,000 years long and light years deep in judgment upon yet another fool. So a lot of folks who don't think too highly of what we do here. Yeah. So this poem is for them. Yeah. <laughs> it's called to those who would not reduce poetry to numbers. <laughs> People who don't like our poetry either never had or have forgotten that they once had. Mothers and fathers who played the numbers and sometimes ran them and sometimes came home with something to show. Often that five or ten dollars that got us over was the difference between hunger and starvation, between a yes or no to a filled prescription for the baby, cab fare to the police station, the morgue, or the courthouse. And every once in a great while, an offering in the collection plate to both give thanks and to stay in the loop with the Almighty. We who came out of those times and went on to write verse come from people whose lives were reduced to numbers. The boss's bottom line, the social worker's caseload, the police statistics for arrests and crimes, the number of deaths from homicide, AIDS, and that new world order of diseases conquered so long ago by science, but now piggybacking back on the bricks, backs of the builders of the Fourth Reich. Those who don't like our poetry just don't know what it means to count. But to tell the truth, we're in it for the fun and the insurrection of it all. And yes, we're in it for the occasional five or ten bucks. We learned a long time back that pride has its limits. <laughs> it's called writing the fight. Words never come to mind at a convenient moment. If you're lucky, you may have a napkin or even a scrap of toilet tissue. <laughs> at that moment, that existential instant, convictions, emotions, feelings are welling up, waiting to be planted, seeds then buds. Finally, a harvest of flowers. You may have a pen, or someone else's pencil, some lipstick, something to hold in your hand to record what's being captured at that moment. The word made clear even as it makes its way from your heart, down the nerves of your arms to your fingertips. You must move quickly. Your mind must be on its feet or else that instant will pass. Your thoughts will become something profound but not written the subject of a hidden funeral of a soul, eulogies richly delivered about what might have been that didn't make it. <coughs> so with paper and pen. I am sitting alone at a table drinking coffee 
at any one of the thousands of cafes and pubs in my city. I write. I scribble. At a certain point, I find myself keeping still for five minutes, five hours, weeks, months. I am in the grip of lethargy, setting in after a binge of non-stop running. And I wonder what I'll do this time to break the stranglehold on my mind. And what if I don't? And even if I do, how long will it take to get my breath back? How long will it be before I begin again? But for now, I have my pen in hand. I am at war for my life. And in this war, a pen is like a piece. You pick it up, you use it. <laughs>